The funding for this video is provided by the amazing members of our Patreon. Also contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Yeah, I started from PBS Kids. What you gonna do? Fight me? Anyway. Roll the video. I'm going to be completely transparent. Society and dead women is something I think about a lot because within the last few years, so many important women in my life have died and I'm very bitchy about it. I don't know how much longer I will be angry about Tashana passing away, but that anger isn't going away anytime soon, I can tell you that. And in my class I'm taking this semester, we are focusing a lot on female American writers and how the people did not see much value in their work until they have died. This story that I'm thinking about in particular is The Coquette. And it's very interesting to say because the main character in that book dies in the end. When talking about cult culture and dead women, Marilyn Monroe comes to mind for many. She is treated more so like a brand than a person, and I used to think nothing of it when I would see books and posters and merchandise of Marilyn Monroe, but when I learned more about her, specifically from the You Must Remember This podcast, I feel so bad for her to the point where I don't feel comfortable spending my money on anything with her name and face left on it. I have been reading the blog Internet Princess by Rainfisher Kwan and there was something she said that stuck forever with me. We consume so much, now perhaps we don't know what it means to exist as something unsellable. I had to give up journaling because I couldn't stop writing for the people who would read it after I was dead. This stuck with me because it made me realize how society as a whole treats dead women. While I understand and Frank's diary was published, to this day, I can't bring myself to read it. And when it comes to movies that nobody likes, Aaliyah, Princess of R&B, along with that Norma the fucking North film, is the first thing that comes to mind. Literally, I'm not even joking when I say that this movie is terrible. It's bad by lifetime movie standards, and the bar for those movies are already in hell. For the record, this movie was not made with care in mind. Aaliyah's family made it clear that they didn't want this film to be made, but Lifetime did it anyway, because they were aware that it would make them money, regardless if it were good or not. Now, how did they know this was going to make them money? Well, our media is constantly making money off dead people in general, but especially dead women, those who are seen as beautiful by society standards. This makes me think of Selena just as well. While Selena's biopic was a well done movie in my opinion, the people behind the film knew it was going to do well because people were not only obsessed with Selena when she was alive, but many were even more obsessed with her when she died. There are numerous people who consider themselves to be Selena fans, including myself, and she died before they were born. So much of the discourse surrounding John Bidet Ramsey became even worse after Patsy, her mom, died. Our society has a fascination with not just dead women, but making money off dead women in real life and with infection. And for the better and for worse. And I want to talk about it all. To start off, I want to bring up Sarah Bartman. So let's take it back all the way to the 1800s before the invention of film and the closest thing we got to that was the circus and theater. If you're familiar with my work, you may have seen a video I created in 2022 about how there's a certain relationship and total drama that made me uncomfortable. The relationship was rooted in fetishism, specifically white men having a fetish for black women, and I went over some history as to why that is not a good thing. I talk about Sarah Bartman, a black woman with a fat ass that was brutalized because so many white people never seen a fat ass before and they were obsessed with it to the point where they paid money to see her. While Sarah's life wasn't great when she was alive, when she died, her body was put on display and whoever was in charge of this was making money from it. White people specifically. Even when she was dead, she still could not rest because society found another way to mistreat her. This time, she could not defend herself if she wanted to. Sarah is 
an early example of dead woman being exploited and what makes it worse is that her life wasn't even all that great when she was alive for starters she was kidnapped she was forced to be in a human circus it's pretty common for us as a whole to talk about dead public figures because it's an important part to learn our history but sarah's story always made me feel so uncomfortable because one she was not laid to rest until around the early 2000s and she died in the 1800s yeah you do the math that's a long ass fucking time anyway and two she is a case of how many people have a little to no respect for dead women, especially if they are women of color. We constantly see news stories about dead wealthy white women, but dead women of color stories are often untold and if they are, it's usually done on TV one. Today, I want to talk about how we treat dead women as a whole. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I was playing as Toji's wife today. I have my glasses on, so it looks a little different. She didn't wear glasses, but the girls who get it, get it. The ones who don't, don't. Hey y'all, it's Harriana, and I'm back with another video. Hi, hello, how are you doing? My name is Harriana, and welcome to and welcome back to The Pirate Ship, also known as Harry's Pirate Ship. I am the captain, you are not my first mate. I don't got no first mate because you wanna know why. Bring your ear closer to the speaker so you can hear me clearly. Nobody's worthy of being the first mate. <laughs> But hi, hello, how are you doing? My name is Harriana, and I like to make content based on nostalgia and family, children's entertainment, and all the issues that I find within those spaces. Today, we are going to be talking about dead women. Y'all already saw the disclaimer. Everything will be timestamped when it comes to spoilers. There's not much for me to say in this introduction now. Let's go ahead and get started. Before anybody tries to drag me, I'm aware that my wig slid back but while filming this. Listen, it was a long day. I I took the cosplay pictures and then next thing you know, um, stuff wasn't looking right. But yes, I am aware my wig slid back. Give me a break. So for those of you who don't know, the entirety of Miraculous Ladybug surrounds a dead woman. But guess what? A uh, Miraculous Ladybug isn't great, like period. No, it has so many freaking flaws. And I told myself that I wanted to start this video off on a positive note when it talks to how we represent dead women in our media and what that can do to the story for the betterment of telling the tale. In Miraculous Ladybug, it's poorly portrayed because the people behind the damn show don't know how to make up their mind about her or what they want to do with her. And it fails the female cast that are alive. Thomas Ashtruck, you got pay for what you did to Penny Rowling. But you want to talk about something that is good when it comes to the subject of dead women and dead girls in general. Let's talk about Zombieland Saga. This is one of those anime I say that is very much underrated and mainly it has to do with the fact that a lot of people aren't interested in idol anime. I'm not either but this is my shit. While Zombieland Saga might seem like a silly show that is about a group of women and girls. It says so much about how our world treats dead females because a lot of the people in this group were mistreated when they were alive and they did not receive love until they died. I also find it very interesting how we don't get to see that after they had passed, all the people that they weren't sure of how they felt about them had big love for them. But it also makes you think about how so many young women miss out on following their dreams because they have passed away tragically. Because literally all the members in the group, Froshushu, yeah that's really the name, <laughs> I'm telling you it's silly but it works. They all have died a tragic death that had hurt somebody that knew them when they were alive. Sakura has a classmate that basically is the manager of Frashushu and he was fully aware of how Sakura wanted to be an idol and it devastated him so much because she never got to live out her dream because she tragically ended up passing away. Literally got smacked with a truck in like the first five minutes of this series. I'm not even joking. It felt as though he was more so devastated for her because he knew this was something that she desperately wanted. So while Zombieland Saga is realistic because it's about a zombie girl group, it's also realistic when it comes to the subject of grief. You truly get to see how the death of all the girls and the women hurt someone. And I think the most sad and most fucked up one has to be with Lily, the youngest member of the group, because even 
even though her dad was fucking awful to her oh he was even more fucked up after she had passed away and he was partly responsible for why she was gone the scene with lily's father really blows me because it shows that he truly did care about his daughter he did love her but he just fucked it up and it got so bad to the point where she was no longer there with him and it's like he lives with this ongoing guilt knowing that he was responsible for why his daughter is no longer there with him it's like throughout the series we get to see that so many of these people that were there when a lot of the girls had died they still have so much pain surrounding that one person especially when it came to Saki because honestly Saki's death was very much preventable but she went out and did that stupid shit anyway and still died but you get to see how that really messed up everyone around her especially the person that was her best friend at the time. Zombie Lift Saga like I said as silly goofy and over the top as it is when it comes to the subject of dead female characters it handles it greatly i do recommend it but if you're somebody that is dealing with a lot of grief like me it may make you cry at times <laughs> And you know what our favorite frog show called Amphibia an important part of the story has to do with the dead woman a lot of people don't seem to figure this out until around like the third season because that's when we finally start to get a little bit more background on the family that Anne stays with. An important part of the story has to do with the dead woman because she is the reason why the two main characters Sprig and Polly live with their grandfather. The reason why the audience is able to have empathy for Polly and Sprig and Hop Pop because we have grown to love the family and seeing that they have made the most of what they had. Because we can figure out that that family is pretty much low income and we also can tell that the mother's death had a took a toll on all of them. It's also very interesting because when it comes to Anne, Sasha, and Marcy going missing, when we see that when they go back on land, you know, back to actual Los Angeles, it's kind of like a lot of people just assumed that they were dead and they were no longer here so it's like they were like wait a minute we were grieving over you we miss you we had no idea where you went there was literally no trace of where you could have been and now that you're back it was actually very beautiful to see Anne reunite with her parents because they most likely have assumed that she probably was dead and that's the reason why I did enjoy why Anne wrote those letters to Sasha and Marcy's parents because they're like they probably thought their kids were dead that's why she sent them a message saying hey your daughter's alive she's just in another dimension <laughs> and even even though we don't really see their mother pretty much at all we still are able to feel bad because we actually got to know the family that's where a lot of stories end up falling flat when they have to do with someone passing away in the stories because they don't do a good job of showing how that could have affected the family sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter if we care or not about the person that is dead usually if we see the effect that it has on that person that was important to them it can work so fast forward to the end of amphibia the girl that was living with them and she ends up dying in amphibia but she still lives in in the human world so they're already dealing with two tragic deaths as a female Woo! we see that the family especially just pretty much everyone in amphibia but especially the planner family we see how that family deeply misses her because while Anne was a handful they loved her while things had gotten better for them as time had passed you can still tell that they were hurt by her dying often when western media portrays death it kind of gets on my nerves because they treat it as if it's a one and done deal and we see that while yes they were able to cope with Anne's death we still see that they are deeply affected by it and it kind of doesn't help the fact that they have a giant statue of Anne in freaking amphibia so they're constantly reminded that oh she's no longer here with us she ended up sacrificing herself so we can live the way amphibia uses dead women reminds me of how they use dead women in the series called Gangsta that I love and won't shut the fuck up now. Now you're sitting here like Harry, what the fuck do these two things have in common? Let me get there. <laughs> Okay, before we can even get into Gangsta and how I said what happened in Amphibia reminds me of that, I need to give you guys a brief rundown of what Gangsta even is. Because I have such a difficult time explaining Gangsta myself, here is just a brief rundown of it from viz.com, Gangsta Volume 1. In the city of Ergastulum, a shady vow filled with made men and petty thieves, whores on the makes, and cops on the stake, there are some deets too dirty for even its jaded inhabits to touch. Enter the handyman, 
Nick and Warwick who take care of the jobs no one else will handle until the day when a cop they know on the force requests to help take down a new gang muscling on the territory of the top mafia family. It seems like business and mayhem as usual, but the handymen are about to find that this job is a lot more than they bargained for. Gangsta is literally one of my favorite manga series of all time, but is it for everyone? Absolutely fucking not. And if you like stories about unwell people like me, I highly recommend checking this one out. And also I brought it up because so many of the important characters in the stories, their lives were negatively affected by a dead woman, specifically a dead mom. That is something that I caught on the more I was reading it because Nick's mom is dead. Alex's mom is dead. Warwick's mom, his biological mom, is probably dead because we never heard from her again, but his stepmama is dead. Loretta's mom, dead. Nina's mom probably dead too because we don't know shit about her parents and she was literally working in the clinic so we know something wasn't right. <laughs> like literally all the moms being dead contributed to the problems that they had. As somebody who has a dead mother, it has contributed negatively to my life. I will go ahead and say that now. I get it. I see them. And I mainly want to focus more on Loretta with her mother dying because her mom being dead deeply like took her childhood away. Loretta is the only female family member of the Crisanto family and she is the leader. And first of all, she's literally like in middle school and she acts like that. And that's one small detail about the story that I truly do like because we can tell that she is in uncomfortable in the environment that she's in to a certain extent because the men in her family have so much responsibility on her. She kind of has no choice but to be there. Loretta makes me so sad because she has no say in her life and so much of that has to do with the fact that her mother died and she had to step up and take that responsibility. She's literally like in eighth grade. And what kills me the most about this because Loretta being placed in this situation almost leads her to being K-worded and she's not even supposed to be in that environment in the first place. What is an eighth grader doing in a nightclub? And I also want to bring up how Loretta's mother was a prostitute and that probably has something to do with why she ended up passing away. Put a pin on that. We are going to come back to that later. Now, Moana is a Disney film that I like more so what it represents than the actual movie. But this one aspect of the film that I'm talking about has to be my favorite. And it kind of won me over with it because I'm going to be honest, I lost so much interest in Moana when she went on the quest. I'm sorry, that's just my personal thing. Drag me. But in Moana, in the middle of the film, the grandmother ends up passing away. And while I am not the biggest fan of this movie, because like I said, I got bored when she went on the fucking quest. I really love the way the grandmother passing away was handled. Moana's grandmother literally passed away at an old age and I really wish a lot of people would realize that it is a blessing to grow old. We live in a day and age and pretty much forever where people think that being over the age of 25 is old and 25 is so young. 30 is young. I wish people would get that. That is so young and there is just so much more to life than just being in your 20s and I love how we got to understand that when it was time for her to go. She was all right because she really did live a fulfilling life and I mentioned Moana mainly because Tashana as you guys know my late friend that had passed away last November she loved Moana and it just pains me to know that she wasn't even able to make it to 30. Tala Moana's grandmother's name she did enjoy how long she was on earth when it came to storytelling but also when she was old she was she had to prepare Moana that she wasn't going to be able to be there anymore and she had to live without her. Disney, in my opinion, is a company that has so many issues regarding misogyny towards old and middle-aged women, and this film does a great job of fighting that ongoing problem. They constantly villainize their older women, or they have very little input on the plots in their works. Like regarding The Lion King 2, as much as I love that movie, it contributes to the ongoing trope of Disney villainizing the only older woman of importance in their stories. And yes, we are allowed to tell stories about older women being terrible because there's so many nuances that go into that. But it's also so many of these characters are just bitter for the sake of being bitter. They are often only important to the story if they are bitter. And if the older woman is nice, she barely has shit to do. As much as I love Tiana's mama, she ain't contributed shit to the story other than telling Tiana she need to go get married. She basically was like, girl, you need to go date. 
Go date. <laughs> and Moana made Tala very fun and they also made her very likable. That's why her dying had such a strong impact on the story. Usually old women in these movies are literal bitches. So when they die or the main character is able to get away from them, we're just like, yeah, bye, move. When Tala died, it impacted the movie because they missed her. When Zara in Lion King 2 died, they were happy that she died because she was no longer there to bother them. Now we have talked about a lot of like the good ways that media represents death and aging and older women and whatnot but now we're starting to get into like the tricky waters and where it starts to get a bit funky listen i know i hardly sucks i've covered this numerous times on this channel in the past but there's one episode of this series that will forever stick with me because it had to do with the concept of money and the artist in this episode somebody assumes that spencer the artist in the series has passed away and because of that they want to buy some of his artwork and they end up paying some good cute little money for it not even gonna lie it was impressive because Spencer was not really making that much from his work so when it had been revealed that people thought he was dead and that's why they wanted to pay for his artwork Spencer continues to pretend like he is not alive so he can continue to get money for his work it just reminds me of that entire thing about how people will literally throw so much money at an artist after they pass away. And that's what we're about to get into. This section right here is where I wanted to get some audience input on it because this is the idea that I've been thinking about for a while regarding Aaliyah and the black community and just Marilyn Monroe and everybody worldwide. Because I had asked y'all the question, do we treat Aaliyah the same way we treat Marilyn Monroe? And I'm going to put some of you guys' responses in here and then I'll be back with my commentary. Black culture does, not on as grand of a scale as Marilyn. Also, I wanted to leave a separate comment. I've also seen people mention the difference with how Whitney Houston and Amy Winehouse were treated in life and death, especially death, when some people believe Whitney was treated like a crackhead as where Amy was treated like a misunderstood soul. I love both of them and I believe both were treated terribly by the media and the people around them. I think they're both idolized and vilified in ways that are totally unrealistic and disconnected from who they were and when they were alive but the specifics of how people talk about them is really different plus people don't even bother to pronounce Aaliyah's name right half the time I feel like many people view Aaliyah as a saint like figure in death in a sense that she was almost treated as something beyond worldly while her close friends and family maintained she was a normal girl who just happened to pass from preventable circumstances at a very young age I think they commodify and idolize her similarly for sure. After death, the brand rolls in for the women and there are no real respect behind it. Just stocks. Makes one wonder if the deaths are really mourned. I feel like, yes, in a sense. Both were extremely talented, beautiful, and underestimated. And both were highly idolized and appreciated more after their passing. I remember someone made this comment and it stuck with me. People adore Aaliyah because she died so young. But when you think about Brandy and Monica and how the public pushed them to the side, would the same thing have happened to her? Both of them are heavily romanticized and a lot is rooted in the perception of who they are. More specifically, the male perspective. I wish they let these women rest instead of claiming a stranger was the love of their life. I'd say yes and no. They were both idolized as legends, even though Marilyn arguably is a lot bigger though. But despite that, they are both women who were looked at, not truly seen, which is why so many people now are obsessed with trying to find out who they truly are underneath all the glitz and glamour, which is part of the reason why these embarrassing biopics are made. However, I do feel like when it comes to their victimhood, they're talked about differently. I always hear the argument that Aaliyah was just fast, therefore not a victim, which is victim blaming at its finest. Whereas so many people are infatuated with Marilyn Monroe being a victim, they forget about every other factor of her life, like that horrible blonde movie. Reminds me of what happened to Sarah Bartman. History won't leave women alone. I work at a woman's clothing goods store. We've had shirts with Aaliyah's face and name and we get underwear and shapewear and makeup and painting and home decor with Marilyn on it. People idolize, sympathize, or victim blame Aaliyah, but they want to be Marilyn. Nobody is buying Aaliyah's old clothes and makeup at auctions for millions of dollars. Kim K didn't wear Aaliyah's clothes on a red carpet. Nobody is selling the idea of being Aaliyah. 
So yes and no. People profit off both for sure, but not the same way or to the same extent. But I don't think it's fair comparison because I can't think of any actual person that gets treated like Marilyn. She's pretty extreme outline among celebrity deaths. Both of them are still capitalized on their deaths, but both are also idolized for their beauty, style, and movies and music. I think people are kind of used them as poster children for tragic Hollywood stories. I don't think so personally. Both women are well respected and loved, but this is going to be racial because Marilyn is white and she gets more respect than Aaliyah who is black. Also, it's a cultural thing. I bet not too many white people know who Aaliyah is because some of them choose not to learn about our culture nor our figures. When it comes to Aaliyah, she is definitely remembered more for her music and talent while Marilyn is more remembered for her controversies and scandals. But one thing they both share in common is that they both were used as tools of misogyny, more so misogyny noir with Aaliyah. We always see her brought up when people compare her to female artists of today and she's not being praised. I still see people disrespecting her when it comes to R. Kelly's situation. I've seen people call her fast or that she is just as guilty all in all is definitely a layered topic that can be dove into now i do want to get on the subject of talking about like merchandise of a celebrity because this isn't like selling like merchandise of like a cartoon character this was like an actual living human being <laughs> i personally am not the biggest fan of selling merchandise of a celebrity who has passed away i know people have their opinions on this but it's just like a personal ick of mine and i don't really like it all that much if you're fine with that that's you but me I just personally don't want to have a shirt of Leo on it no matter how much of a fan I am of her same with Selena Quintanilla same with Whitney Houston I will still purchase their CDs and listen to their music and whatnot you know actually paying for the music but when it comes to getting a shirt with them on it I don't know I just can't do it it's just the ick it's just icky to me like a lot of people know what Aaliyah looks like because her face is constantly being sold on posters and t-shirts but so many people don't really really know who Aaliyah is like so many people don't know no more than three songs by her which I understand valid because for the longest we were not really able to stream her music the main reason I was able to know so many Aaliyah songs is because my dad had her CDs but so many people see Aaliyah as a beautiful woman who passed away in her early 20s this is why I say we treat Aaliyah the same way we treat Marilyn Monroe to a certain extent many people haven't even seen three movies by Marilyn Monroe but they know her face because it's constantly being sold. Marilyn Monroe is more of a brand at this point than a person. Like it's to the point where there's even a published fan fiction about her that ended up getting a film. Y'all know Blonde, the most recent NC-17 film that we probably not gonna see another NC-17 film in another five years or so. That is Marilyn Monroe fan fiction. It's based on the book by Joyce Carol Oates. You can even say that Aaliyah ended up getting the Marilyn Monroe treatment when it came to her Lifetime movie because that movie is just flat out disrespectful. And it just pains me to know because Marilyn Monroe, we really don't know much about her family because I listen to a lot about her on the You Must Remember This podcast. And it's kind of like, where is this money going to? Who is keeping all of this? Is it going to her family? The very little of them that we knew of that were there. Like, she just feels like a brand more so than a person. And now we are into this section of the video where the Aaliyah and Marilyn Monroe thing is what made me want to make this. But honestly, the way Jujitsu Kaisen treats dead women and just dead girls and just dead females in general, I have some words. I have some takes and I just really want to sit here and talk about it. I'm just going to sit here and say now, just because the female characters are good for shonen does not mean that they are good period because there's a lot of work that needs to be done i'm gonna need y'all to expand your media diet when it comes to anime and manga if you want stories about better female characters please go step outside of shonen at least battle shonen jujutsu kaisen has a serious problem when it comes to what it does with its female cast and i'm more interested in the conversation that surrounds a lot of these characters than what the story has done with themselves that character in particular has to be with yuki we're going to come back to her later there's an amazing video here on youtube that talks about how jujitsu kaisen has let down its entire female cast and i'm going to link that down below for y'all to check out because she was spitting 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 facts on top of facts on top of facts rags on top of rags on top of rags as i mentioned that a lot of the 
characters in Jujutsu Kaisen, they are really just put in the story to advance a guy's plot. Or if they're not put in the story for that purpose, they are often very much forgotten and done nothing with it to the point where they might as well be dead. I'm looking at you, Momo and Miwa. I'm sorry that Gege don't know how to write you. <laughs> Because of the way Jujutsu Kaisen treats its characters, its female characters specifically that are alive, that's why it bothers me so much what the story does to them when they are dead. Particularly the dead women that's been dead from the beginning of the story's run. Like I said, this entire section has to do with Jujutsu Kaisen spoilers. So like I said, if you don't want to see it, skip skip move i'm sorry move on but i want to sit here and talk about a decision that kenjaku had made this situation right here really made me unhappy because i just was frustrated with the direction of where this was going because jujitsu kaisen doesn't do a good job of treating its female characters well and when i say well i mean having better writing because it feels as if when gege doesn't know what to do with any more of the female characters they just get rid of them they either act as if they don't exist anymore and just write them off to the sidelines like Miwa and Momo or they kill them off like Nobara and Yuki. The choice that Gege ended up making with Kenjaku really irritates me because it has so many bigot undertones to it mainly because of the way this story does not handle a lot of aspects when it comes to a social issues. Well I already know people gonna be like you wrong you're getting that shit up. I don't care I'm saying it but in the story the story summary a boy named Yuji and we know little to nothing about his family for a while. So we end up finding who Yuji's biological parents are and one parent is Jin. Jin is the father but everybody was like who is Yuji's other parent? Yuji's other parent is Kenjaku. Kenjaku is basically genderless I'd say. They are able to you know put themselves in other people's bodies and be able to like you know procreate and whatever. Yeah guess what Kenjaku had done? So Yuji's mother had passed away. Jin was devastated. So you want to know what Kenjaku does? Kenjaku takes Yuji's mother's dead body literally takes her corpse puts his brain inside of it and then goes and has sex with Jin. Carried that baby for nine months and had Yuji. Now looking at the nuances of the storytelling I understand it because Kenjaku is not a good person. They're not even really a person. They're technically a curse. But anyway, Kenjaku is a literal horrible being. I get that. I understand it. So it makes sense in the nature of their character for them to do something so freaking foul. Makes sense. I get it. Because the purpose of Kenjaku in the story, we're not supposed to like them. We're not supposed to like them, period. This actually made them, made me dislike them even more because I'm just like, Yuji was set up from birth. He deserves better. But why did it irritate me so bad? Not so for the fact of Kenjaku just being a terrible thing. It frustrates me because this series has an ongoing problem with doing an ass job of writing their female characters are alive. So yeah, I'm gonna be looking a certain kind of way with how you treat the dead women. Like at this point, Maki isn't even Maki no more. She's just Toji, her cousin, who is a man. Because a lot of people sit here and say that Maki is the most well-written female character in Jujutsu Kaisen. While yes, I get that. At a certain point in the story, she ain't Maki no more. It's Toji. And I get it because her and Toji mirror each other because they both left the Zenin clan. I hate that bitch ass family. I talked about them in another video that I had made here. But I'm like, at this point, it just feels as though that's all to her. Gege, if you miss Toji so bad, you shouldn't have killed him off. And speaking of Toji, give me a minute because we're going to talk about him right now. Like I said, a lot of the women in Jujutsu Kaisen end up dying to, you know, progress the story of another man or guy in the story. Because like I said, literally Yuji wouldn't exist if his mother wasn't dead. Now we know that Toji's first wife, who is the mother of Megumi, she ended up tragically passing away. Yeah, I get it. That is what ended up making Toji kind of like lose his shit. He was basically going off the walls. But that woman was somebody that loved him. The first person that ever really showed him some type of actual true love and care and whatever the fuck. And she ended up tragically passing away. And you know, that is what ended up making so much of what Toji's story is with him just basically grieving and not doing a good job of what he was doing with that. But you want to know, like I said, Jujutsu Kaisen is deeply careless when it comes to its female cast with the exception of Maki. Gege didn't even give Toji's wife a name. 
This, this she has no name. She has no name. How? How sway? I don't get it. She literally has no fucking name. That's how little care Gege puts into so many of these female characters. It fucking frustrates me. I was like, the least thing you could have done for her to be so important to the story was give her a name. But we couldn't even get that. And I think the point where JJK and how it treats its female cast really, really started to irk me because it's always bothered me from the beginning. But what JJK did with Yuki really is what made me put the series down for a second. It's interesting when it comes to the conversation of Yuki and how JJK treats his female cast and basically with them dying and all of that. It's extremely interesting because I noticed the conversation that surrounds Yuki's death. It's a bit different than how people talk about Nobora's death. And I'm going to have my friends come on here and talk about Nobora's death because they can put it into words better than I can. Hi guys, this is Ella Pastoral here and Harry practically asked me to come on here and tell y'all why in my personal opinion I feel like JJK is abusing their female characters and is killing and overusing the dead woman trope in order to further the plot. So this is going to have some spoilers for season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen as well as the most recent arc of Jujutsu Kaisen the manga because I feel like if you have been keeping up with all of the leaks you know how bad it is right now for fans of the female characters of Jujutsu Kaisen. The first huge hint of me seeing that Gege, the creator of Jujutsu Kaisen, does not care about his female characters, most definitely has to be with Nobora. If you guys hadn't watched Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2, you wouldn't know where Nobora is right now. Uh, Nobora and practically everybody got extremely screwed over by the Shibuya incidents. It was bad. But in the couple of episodes where we saw her last, the doctor dude literally was like, Hey, Yuji, I don't want to get your hopes up, but... With the way Nobora is, there is hope that she is going to get better. And so me as a casual watcher, I was like, yeah, that means we're going to see her in season two. Like a dummy, I decided to go onto TikTok and I don't know what I did to get spoiled, but that's besides the point. Everybody looked at me and they were like, oh damn, Nobora has gone. Hello? <laughs> Hello, what do you mean she's gone? They literally hinted that she was going to be okay. Maybe she wouldn't be, you know, all the way good. I expected her to lose like two arms and a leg. But no, they said she's gone. And I just feel like if you look at the list of female characters of Jujutsu Kaisen, who's left? Who's left? And I really didn't realize this until Harry brought this to my attention. But another person who is a great example of the dead woman trope has to be Megami's sister. How many of y'all remember that Megami had a sister? Because I straight up didn't remember that Megami had a sister until I was reading a fan fiction. And like <laughs> in the fan fiction, they were like, yeah, Megami has gone through so much. He lost his best friend. Um, he doesn't have any parents and his sister's in a coma. And I just thought this was, you know, the fanfic taking liberties. But when I Googled it, Homeboy has a whole sister. And then I remembered, I had a flashback to season two where Ghetto was like practically laughing maniacally and was like, oh my gosh, I have so many sleeper cells. And we got showed a random girl who was in a coma. Turns out that random girl wasn't a random girl. It was Megami's sister. And I was like, okay, let me, let me see what's going on with her. Let me see what's going on with her. Man, 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 man. <laughs> Guys, tell me why in order to further the plot. <laughs> so Kuna ends up killing Megami's sister. I was so pissed, y'all, when I found that out because literally Ghetto, it was hinted that Ghetto was the one who was going to do something evil and diabolical with Megami's sister. But Gege was like, this is equal opportunity bullying. Like, instead of being Ghetto that finally takes out Megami's sister, it's Sukuna. Sukuna's taking out everybody. But it really goes to show you that when it comes to anime, Female characters will always get the worst, worst possible outcomes. Because guys, who's left? Who's left? And I feel like if you are born as a female character in the JJK-verse, you are going to be used as a plot point to further a man's plot. Because what did Megami's sister do? Shadi was in a coma. I thought the coma was going to save her, protect her, cover her in the blood of Jesus. But no. 
And I just feel like if you are someone like me who always has a tendency to love the female characters in anime, good luck, Charlie. Good luck. But like I said, I'm more interested in the conversation that surrounds Yuki than the death herself because her death is one that I mostly don't agree with. Baby, I love Choso too as much as the next person. Girl, girl, come on, come on, Yuki, stand up. But it makes me sit and think about how people speak about Yuki. Like, would they talk about her differently if she didn't die? Because the way people speak about Yuki reminds me so much of the way people talk about Aaliyah. And it's so much sadness about what she could have been. Yuki, like Aaliyah, is a person that I rarely ever see slander for. Like, so many people don't have anything bad to say about Yuki, even though she made some choices that were very much questionable. Like, what she did for Choso was very much beyond me to a certain extent. And when it comes to Aaliyah, so many people haven't even really seen the movies that she was in. And if they did, they were know that a lot of them were not all that good. Aaliyah was great in them. Was the film overall good itself? Absolutely fucking not. Queen of the Damned, it was beautiful beautifully shot but it needed so much work with that script and even when it comes to Marilyn if you actually watch the movies that she was in a lot of them were very much basic and mid but many people won't say that because when a woman who was pretty liked by the public dies it view it changes the way you view her forever you don't want to say anything bad about her because her dying her literally losing her life is like the worst thing that happened to her like i said the conversation that surrounds yuki differs so much from nobora as yuki was a woman that was seen to be like kind of perfect she was basically kind of seen as like the cool girl to a certain extent while nobora was very far from perfect like we saw her fail all the time and that is something that i did truly like about her character you know up until she got wrote out the fucking story and we technically didn't really see yuki fail until like her death and this right here leads me into the next part of this video respectability politics so remember how i mentioned in gangsta how loretta's mother was a prostitute yeah society treats dead women differently when they are you know a tax worker even though loretta's mom is dead even if she was still alive the nature of the environment that the story takes place in which mirrors the real world by the way they probably wouldn't even have had her leave the family anyway they did they, the family technically did not care how young loretta was but it's because she was seen as innocent they had her running the front of everything and then they had the nerve to get mad when loretta acted her age i'm like you literally put an eighth grader in charge of the fucking family like i said because of the nuances that go into the story of gangsta and we see that a lot of it has to do with women's stories and them being belittled and this and the third oh my gosh i love this story so much it also makes a lot of sense because gangsta we know that is written by a woman and it is a seinen because we do see how differently the story treats text workers that are alive that's why i was like maybe if loretta's mother was still living and breathing they probably wouldn't even have had her lead the family because a lot of people openly hate text workers there is so much anti text work rhetoric that is constantly spread on this platform and it actually pisses me the fuck off because our society hates text workers so much that when they die they often make little to no noise i'm gonna sit here and talk to you guys about a woman by the name of helen jewett if you are not familiar with whorephobia it literally is just the dislike and mistreatment of text workers I will never forget that time that this nigga was trying to say we were making up things as if there is not proof on top of proof on top of proof of the world mistreating tax workers, especially the ones who are women, not cisgender, and are gay. Helen Jewett was a woman in the 1800s who worked as a prostitute. Her mother had died when she was really young. Her dad literally fucking sucked and then he died do and then she went into prostitution as a way to support herself and she also was taken advantage of by men sadly that contributed to her passing away the penny press in new york city the murder of prostitute would likely have been an obscure event except for the emergence of the penny press newspapers in new york city which sold for one cent intended to focus on sensational events the New York Herald, which James Gordon Bennett had started a year earlier, seized on the Jewett murder and began a media circus. The Herald published lurid descriptions of murder scenes and often published exclusive stories about Jewett and Robin, which excited the public. Much of the information published in the Herald was exaggerated, if not fabricated, but the public gobbled it up. Helen's death is interesting to talk about because while it was one of the first major stories about a prostitute being K-worded, 
it did get sympathy from people but people also saw this as a form of gossip and continued to speak badly about a woman who suffered badly enough gossip is something that everyone does whether they realize it or not and when it became public that a text worker had lost her life it became a hot topic for many and helen's story reminds me a bit of sarah's because it's as if people didn't care about her until she was dead but sarah's story has massage noir thrown into the mix i'm not trying to sit here and compare their tragedies and the treatment they got but helen being white did contribute to how less bad she got it than sarah while helen was clowned by many people sadly sarah's body was left on display and wasn't laid to rest until the 2000s Shit like this is why if your feminism does not include women and in envies of color, I want nothing to do with it. Because if you are failing to see that racism comes into the mix when the victim isn't white, don't talk to me. So moving forward from talking about Helen and respectability politics and dead women in society, I really want to talk about Whitney Houston because the way literally so many well-known industry professionals have mocked her death to this day like literally last year i think was like the most recent instance of somebody making a very distasteful joke about whitney passing away it's still going on she still gets clowned up and down social media when it comes to everything that she had going on. Whitney Houston's death is constantly made a mockery and so much of it has to do with the press making a mockery of her while she was alive. It's either they talk, make fun of the struggle she had with drugs, her sexuality, because so many people are so curious to know if Whitney Houston was interested in women or not. It's literally none of our fucking business. And if it's not the drug use, if it's not her sexuality, it's about her very, very complicated relationship that she had with Bobby Brown. Like the way people talk about Whitney Houston differs so much from what they say about Aaliyah. Gerard Carmichael is being slammed for a joke he made about the late pop star Whitney Houston at the 80th Golden Globe Awards on Tuesday, January 10th. The 35 year old comedian served as the award show's first black host during the ceremony, which found him cracking jokes about the lack of diversity in the Hollywood foreign press, Tom Cruise's involvement with the Church of Scientology, and Will Smith's infamous 2021 Oscar slap. During his opening monologue, the star and creator of The Carmichael Show greeted the A list audience with a reference to Houston's 20 2012 tragic death. So we are here live from the hotel that K worded Whitney Houston, the Beverly Hilton. Carmichael said to stun silence. Regarding Kanye West, people think that so much of his out of the ass behavior is something new when no, there's been problems since I was in elementary school. And what's the most concerning thing about it is that it often gets written off and he learns nothing from his mistakes because this happened before he went on that anti-semitic rant he found a way to make fun of whitney houston in the most expensive way possible whitney houston's ex-husband bobby brown is not a fan of a cover art for pusha t's album daytona which features a photo of whitney houston's drug infested bathroom taken in her atlanta home in 2006 after a alleged binge kanye west who produced the album reportedly paid 85k to license the photo for the seven in song collection released on may 25th why would he post that album cover brown said in an interview with rolling stone that's really disgusting that he did that that's in really bad taste something should happen to kanye he's already i'm not saying that bobby huh? remember these are bobby's words not mine y'all i knew that when i first met him now he's pushing the bar a bit he knew somebody to slap him or something. I'm just the person to do it. Whitney Houston Estate issued a statement Tuesday in response to the cover saying it was extremely disappointing in Kanye's choice to use the photo. Even in Whitney's death, we see that no one is exempt from the harsh realities of the world, the statement said. When I tell you that people are constantly making a mockery of Whitney Houston's struggles when she was alive, Target is one of the people who did it. Target is literally responsible. Let me read y'all this shit. With Whitney Houston's passing not even a month in the past, Target stores quickly pulled an offensive greeting card mocking the pop singer from the shelves. The card poking fun at Houston's troubled relationship with former husband Bobby Brown was sold in the national chain stores before the singer's death on February 11th. The text greeting card said, next time you think of dating a bad boy, consider Whitney Houston. That's all I'm going to say. Because this greeting card literally was mocking her shortly after she had passed away. 
Oh, this is so ghetto. And it also does it a lot when it has to do with Marilyn Monroe, and that just has to do with full on massage noir right there. But moving more so back with the black community, because it was known more to the public about Whitney's struggles with drugs and her behaviors. Most of what the public knew about Aaliyah was in a most positive life. While people have made a mockery of Whitney's lows and they still do to this day, people still make homophobic ass jokes around with her along with thinking that the way Bobby Brown treated her was funny. One of the few times I saw in black media where somebody called out the way Bobby Brown treated Whitney was in the Parkers. That's saying something. At the end of the day, we don't know these people because like I said, we only know what was presented publicly about all of these people. So much of Whitney's lows were presented publicly to us while so much of what we know about Aaliyah was presented positively to us. And I noticed that so many people tend to have like a big parasocial relationship when it comes to Aaliyah. I love Aaliyah as much as the next person, but at the end of the day, we didn't know her. And we have to accept that. We can't sit here and make up a whole bunch of theories and this and that and the third about her life because she was a whole person. She's not a fictional character. And it gets to the point where a lot of people talk about how we treat celebrities like fictional characters. Oh, I think y'all are a lot worse when it comes to celebrities that are dead. It's even more fictionalized over there. Like I said, all those literal published Marilyn Monroe fan fictions, those shits were written after she died. People see a lot of dead celebrities, especially when it comes to like Whitney Houston, as fictional fucking characters opposed to them being real people. Because anytime I see people talking about Whitney Houston this, Whitney Houston that, they're making so many nasty ass distasteful jokes about her. But that's because we publicly saw that Whitney was a very flawed woman. She also was a celebrity that was very much well liked. She was funny, she was quirky, she was over the top. I love Whitney Houston. But seeing because of the way she was and people knew about so much of what she was dealing with personally, people like to use that against her. It makes me think of that entire situation about being a perfect victim, which doesn't fucking exist. Whitney Houston deserves better. And I'm just high key tired of this black media because this is black media that is doing this shit, clowning her all the time. So much of popular media thrives off of dead women. And so many of the true crime and makeup videos here on YouTube are about people being brutalized to death. Our society is obsessed with dead women who are pretty because they know that it will make them money. And I'm not sitting here and saying that you can't tell stories about dead women. But there's a fine line between nuanced and disrespectful. If you have a history of misogyny in your work, I'm not gonna take it too lightly when you take advantage of a dead woman's body in order to make profit. You have a long history of misogyny and do you wanna sit here and talk about a female celebrity that tragically passed away? I'm gonna be giving you a little side eye, all right? I'm looking at you, Kanye. I'm sorry, I know we get on here and talk about so much of the problematic ass bullshit that Kanye does this and that and the third, but that all always will forever leave a bad taste in my mouth for what he had done to Whitney Houston. It's like the more and more time passes, people find new ways to just brutalize her. And I'm just like, I'm tired. Can we let her rest? So it is that time of the month again. Basically once a month, I do a Patreon only Q&A at the end of one of my bigger, longer videos. And we are about to go ahead and get to the questions. If you want to participate in the Patreon only Q&A at the end of these videos, just join the Patreon. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. So first question has to be, you may have already talked about this, but so please be direct with, to me. The, the, okay, let me start over. You have already talked about this, so please direct me to the video. But if you do not have, but do you have advice for people who are new to attending cons and how to be respectful? P.S. Your cosplays are some of my favorite, even if I don't know where they're from. Thank you so much, first of all. So when it comes to like attending cons and how to be like safe and respectful, one of the big things about like when it comes to a con, y'all, if you want to get a picture with somebody, you need to ask. It is rude to take pictures of people without their consent. You need to fucking ass that is one thing that just gets on my nerves y'all just ask a lot of people that are dressed up in cosplay oftentimes they be wanting to be photographed they don't mind taking pictures with people just simply ask ask for consent if you would like to get a picture with them usually when it comes to like 
you know like hey is it okay if i wrap my arm right here you know is it okay if i do this and then the third it's important to ask for consent when it comes to taking pictures with these people and just getting a picture with them in general that is one big thing that i am big on you need to ask when it comes to pictures and being respectful and you're going to be going into dealers den because the dealers den is where like the vendors are where all the artists are and whatnot um usually when it comes to like looking at their stuff when they have like the book right here i usually just ask them hey is it okay if i flip through the pages is it okay if i do this and then the third and i'm like yeah sure go ahead and do that but don't this is something that gets on my nerves when it comes to a lot of people when it comes to cons because a lot of them do not have etiquette when they come to these places is somebody if you're standing in front of an artist's table and just chit-chatting and talking and this and then the third and you're not even talking to the artist you're sitting here and talking to somebody else go fucking move get out of their way that is something that has always bothered me when i see people go to these places because a lot of these vendors they are there to work they are there to make that bag that is their job that is their livelihood that is how they eat and pay their bills you're literally ruining service for them we're just standing in front of their table and laughing and carrying on and this and that and the third um don't ask artists and vendors could you get a fucking discount on their work don't ask a small business that please y'all it's so rude don't do that to them if you have questions during a panel make sure you always like raise your hand and whatnot if you're confused politely ask one of the volunteers or staff or direction or whatever if somebody is scaring you walk away please i'm very big when it comes to like con safety and whatnot because of the entire situation that I had to do with hall mat please bring your own water bottles please bring your own water bottles and you decide to go to a party at a con make sure you are watching your drink if you leave your drink somewhere let it be don't go back and take a sip because a lot of people at cons and just events in general they be liking to roofie people for the most part cons are supposed to be fun by the way don't be going to a con over here trying to get a picture with all these little social media personalities and this and that and the third go because you want to have fun there is so much stuff that you could do at a con like yeah you can go and meet famous voice actors and people that are industry professionals and this and that and the third but like y'all go to the game room go to these workshops dress up like go have fun go to panels engage in panels host your own freaking panels there is so much more to do at a con than it just being an instagram tiktok and twitter meetup that's what so many people see them as if you see that as that fine good for you do what you please but i be wanting to go to a con so i can have fun okay and next person asks how do you do your business card they're so cute um basically you can find any basic software you'll be able to do it you're able to find a, a template or whatnot i know vistaprint is a good one to be able to get your business cards and be able to design them i design my cards in clip studio paint that's another thing that a lot of people don't seem to realize that you can do over there and i usually go and get them printed at staples because i used to do them like print on demand online through like any type of service and whatnot but when i realized that i can get a lot more for less at staples that is my go-to i go ahead design it on like either clip studio or some other just online random thing sometimes i'll use InShot app on my phone or whatnot but it's not necessarily difficult and the person who made my avatar off be kiki love them um i use that usually if you have some type of art on your business cards it's actually good to sell with that but yeah that's how i make my business cards i usually just like you know use kind of like an online free software that has like business card templates i customize it myself i want to change up some things i put it in clip studio i'll save it on my flash drive i'll go and take it to staples and then get it printed okay next question um uh, what are your top five cartoon network shows oh shit um oh um basic world of gumball for sure is one of those so we have gumball uh what else came on cartoon network the marvelous misadventures of flapjack i rewatch flapjack every two years and it's a it's hitting a two-year mark so i need to go ahead and give it a rewatch and at Eddie, the powerful girls i don't know no more because my opinions have changed so much on that damn series who but it's still like a staple of like who i am as a person it made me the person i am today but like gumball and marvelous adventures of flapjack those are like my good talk to right there um 
Mad, I don't care, Mad TV, that was my shit. Mad on Cartoon Network, loved it. And then I'd say like the last Cartoon Network show, oh my God, I don't wanna pick like one more because I love so many Cartoon Network series. It literally like was like a big ass staple of like my childhood and just me, me being the person that I am. Uh, I don't want to pick one more. I love Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. I love Hi Hi Buffy Have a Yumi. I love Teen Titans. Like I love so many of these series and I just I don't want to pick one more. I love regular show. I love so much stuff that came on Cartoon Network. I hate the fact that you're trying to make me pick. Uh, I think I'm gonna go with um I have puffy on me. I'll go with that one. That's my last one. Uh, last question. Uh, if you can give any show that's been canceled a second chance, which one would it be? Uh, Julie and the Phantoms. I love me some Julie and the Phantoms. I was sad to see that it wasn't coming back, but I wasn't surprised to see that it got canceled. But like giving another show another chance. I'm trying to think of something that I like grew up with that we that really could have used like another freaking season because there was just so much more left to do with it. Not gonna lie, I would like to see All Grown Up get another season. I love All Grown Up so much. All Grown Up could get like one more good season. I think Witch could get another season too just as well because there was just so much that just was unexplored within like like the first two seasons, there was just so much more that was like left with the story to be told. But Gangsta, Gangsta deserves a second season. Gangsta just deserves to be finished just in general. It's literally one of my favorite things ever at this point. And that concludes today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I don't know if y'all can tell, but I am drained. I am running off Red Bull and this shit really did much anything because I ended up having to take Tylenol because I was in some pain. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really like this hair. Like, I really like this hair. I don't know. I feel like the glasses makes it look a little different. So I'm gonna take them off right now. The main reason I had them on is because I had to read on my phone. But like, I like this. I like this. Thank you guys so much for watching. I deeply do appreciate it. New stuff is coming soon to my shop. New cosplays are coming soon. This and the third i'm just thankful that you watched this video with the ad on i deeply do appreciate it i will be out of office for like the remainder of this week so yeah comment toji's wife down below if you got to this point in the video please engagement will be great toji's wife oh uh, yeah thank you so much for watching i said that so many times already but like i said i'm tired y'all <laughs> nothing <laughs> I'm tired. I'm yawning on camera. But have a great day, night, or whatever time of the day you chose to watch this video. I'm just grateful that you watched it with the ads on. All right, thank you. Goodbye. Now, now that you see, you should be aware of the power of three. They come to fight as fast as they can. They're dangerous yet fabulous. Because the Utonia made them is true. They are the colors of pink, green, and blue. They'll catch you in the blink of an eye and do it all before bedtime. They coming through and fighting oh. And everyone they shocking oh. You know no one can stop them all Because of the chemical oh. acts They coming through they and coming fighting through. And everyone they shocking mm -hmm. You know no one can stop them all Because of the Cherishing power, part two of a kind Both wanna save the world before